Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard. We've got another episode coming right up for you. And by we, I mean me. All right. So, hey, welcome. Uh, welcome to all the new subscriptions, subscribers, subscriptioners. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's been, it's been fun. And you've been an encouragement to me and helping me press forward and it's not easy i don't want to like say oh i'm you know a victim blah 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 move this a little closer and poor me or whatever because i my life is is very cushy compared to most people um however it is challenging at times to record and edit and post and especially with pastoring a church and of course having a family and everything else um, it's challenging, but God is good. And so uh, hopefully you can find some use for this. Um, <clears throat> and you're learning something and it kind of be either being a, just a couple different things, like being exposed to other things, um, kind of in a news way, but also just other ideologies, other philosophies out there besides Christianity, uh, or those that pretend to be Christianity, which we'll be looking at today. Um, and just kind of getting you to think, uh, that's, that's the goal, right? And ultimately being against the world, the way the world is, and for the sake of it, though, not just leaving the world and say, well, you know, I'm just going to go hide in a cave or I'm going to go do whatever, but being against it, but for its own sake, uh, because Christ has overcome the world. Jesus is overcome the world. He says that we'll have trouble in this world, but he's overcome it. So fear not, don't worry. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today in liberation theology. This is something uh, that's pretty popular as of late, and it kind of takes different flavors and form. Sometimes there's a little chocolate sauce on it. Sometimes there's, you know, some cherries, sometimes no, no sauce and sprinkles. Sometimes there's some toasted peanuts and people dress it up a little differently and they make their liberation hot fudge Sunday, uh, look really nice and sound really nice, but is it really nice? That's the question we're gonna be looking at. So I'm going to watch a video right now of a gentleman looks probably around my age, maybe a little younger. Uh, and he's got some videos out. This is much more concise than me. <laughs> um, I am long-winded, if you didn't already notice that. But he goes, he's got a pretty nice beard, needs to be tamed a little bit. But regardless, we're going to watch this. He's going to explain liberation theology. And we're going to kind of jump in and compare this to the Bible. Because after all, it's theology, which is the study of ology, like zoology, biology, uh, cosmology. And theos, theos being God. So it's the study of God. Kind of a big deal. And as Christians, we should be concerned with the study of God. Right? 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 So before if before we get there, go ahead and uh, like. It's down here somewhere. And uh, subscribe. I'd really appreciate that. Or maybe the like is over here and the subscription's over here. Anyway, uh, it does help get out to more people. Thank you again for subscribing and taking some time out of your day and watching this. Even if you watch it on fast mode, I usually do that, one, two, five, or sometimes one, five. Although I don't know if I could stand myself and how fast I talk on one, five, personally. But if you can, hey, more power to you. And also these are palm trees, not weed leaves. It's not, it's not weed. <laughs> it kind of looks like it. Um, maybe I need to rethink about wearing this shirt more often. It's a very Hawaiian-ish shirt. No, they're palm trees, I promise. All right, let's watch this. Today I want to talk a little bit about liberation theology, what it is, why I'm drawn to it, and hopefully I'll inspire you to do a little more digging after this introduction. Liberation theology is a movement that has its roots in the work of a Latin American liberation theologian by the name of Gustavo Gutierrez, who wrote a book called A Theology of Liberation. Gutierrez himself distinguished between three types of poverty, spiritual poverty, voluntary poverty, and material poverty. All right, Gustavo Gutierrez. So right off the bat, we need to understand that history has matters, right? History, um, this is why I love history, church history, just history in general, because you don't just get people's ideas and ideologies and philosophies and so on, but they have those out of something. I'm doing this because of this, because of that, because of other things, right? The Reformation 500 plus years ago happened because of these things that were happening in history right? The Puritans trying to purify the English church, the, the Church of England in the 17th century occurred and did this and then ended up leaving and, you know, by and large coming to America and doing their thing. And a lot of us are here because of that. And so 
Things happen. They're not never in a vacuum. We're living history right now and how things and how churches and how people operated in the middle of a pandemic and the middle of this craziness and the fear mongering and either bowing down to petty tyrants or pushing against them or finding a middle way and all the things that you do, you're going to be answering not only at the great white throne, but in the interim up to your children, your grandchildren and so on. So think for the future. Uh, many people are just out there. Oh, the rapture, this is happening. Oh, oh, oh Antichrist is right around the corner. And they're not planning ahead. Christ could come back at any time, yes. But plan for the future because people have thought that Christ was coming back since he left. <laughs> like, I mean, we're, we look in the Bible and there's people aren't working. And it's like, what are, what are you doing? Well, Jesus is coming back. Why? No, he says, get to work, get to work. So if you're not working, if you're hoping for some rapture, some flyaway, some this, some that, don't. At least not put that in the back of your mind. Work for the Lord. Be about the master's business. So I encourage you with that. So that's an aside. This guy talks about Gustavo Gutierrez forming a uh, theology in one sense. It's very, very, very new. Anything that's new is always, always, usually always bad. Um, as the old phrase goes, if it's new, it isn't true. And if it's true, it isn't new. And I would say that that would be very much, very much the case. So early 70s. Well, what happened in the early 70s? Well, we have Roe v. Wade here in America, 1973. We have the sexual revolution before that. We have no-fault divorce. We have uh, prayer being removed out of schools. We have uh, lots of people not teaching scripture and the Bible just in general. That's another topic for another time. Um, all sorts of things. We have the Scopes trial from the 1920s about teaching even evolution and Darwinism in schools and, and all these other things. All this stuff is happening. You know, the race riots, multiple assassinations, JFK, MLK, um, Malcolm X, lots and lots of things happening in America and in the world in general, right? So he's not isolated. He creates this thing and he says this. And so he identifies three different aspects of liberation. So spiritual poverty or a radical openness to God is something desirable in Christianity. Voluntary poverty or the act of detachment from material wealth in solidarity with the poor is also uh, something desirable. However, the third kind of poverty, material poverty, is always evil. Material poverty involves the privation of goods that are necessary for living a dignified life. Things like food, shelter, clothing, health care, education. Liberation theology holds that God always takes the side of those on the margins of society and those subject to material poverty. God is working in history to liberate the poor. All right, so did you catch that? God always takes a side of the marginalized in society. So right there, that's showing distinctions. That's showing partiality. God doesn't always take the side of the marginalized. Because now what that does is that pits a, an us and them, the oppressor and the oppressed. Sound familiar? That's where a lot of this comes from. No, not all of it, because there's ideas floating around and people will attach them and create new ones and spin and everything else. But everybody's a sinner. Everybody's fallen short of God's glory. This man with the beard, Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, and everybody else you know, right? The people that we've I've talked about some of these on some of these videos, Ibram X. Kendi and others that, well, there's this and this and this. What this does, this sets up two different groups. This sets up these people who are oppressed and these people who are justified in themselves and people who are the oppressors, who are oppressing these people, but with no actual view of sin or oppression and dealt with in a real biblical way. It's just, well, they're the oppressors because they've got stuff and these people don't have stuff. Okay, so what, what about these people? How do these people get delivered? By tipping the scale and doing the seesaw, the teeter-totter, and making the oppressor the oppressed and the oppressed the oppressor. It doesn't work. We saw this. We've seen this with the rainbow people. We've seen this with a lot of other things over the last few years of the last decade and a half, two decades, where it's like, oh, we just want this. We just want this. Now they're on the offensive. Now they're going for the jugular and saying, now we're going to oppress you, the very people that were oppressing us. And it's like, what about turning the other cheek, Christians? What about do treating people the way you want to be treated and so on? But God doesn't always take the side of the oppressed. Absolutely not. Now, does he... Take the side of the oppressed, orphans and widows in their distress, and keep yourself unstained from the world? Yes, that's what James tells us. But you can't just take a few verses out of context, which he doesn't use any verses, by the way, if you've noticed this. He doesn't cite any scripture. Now, is he basing it kind of on scripture? Sure. But this guy's also not only um, 
not only is he a radical, and not to say all radicals are bad per se, I would say I'm a radical in some some regard, um, but he is also a Roman Catholic, and he's on the left side in the Roman Catholic Church. Well, there's a lot I would disagree with in the Roman Catholic Church, pro- almost most of it. <laughs> and so we have to also know that as well. We, we can't just say, well, you know, this, that, and the other, that's fine, and just we're just going to go with this. God always takes the side of the oppressed. No. God is working in history to liberate the poor. So consequently, to follow God. God is working in history to liberate the poor. Liberate them from what? Give them stuff? Because material possession is pithy. It's small. You're going to die eventually. Do you have forgiveness of sin? He doesn't say that. Liberation theology doesn't even deal with this. Uh, at all. It's just kind of the population and this, and he's using structures and oppression and these other things and saying, well, you know, these people are oppressed. God's going to be on their side. Do you have chapter and verse, please? Maybe. I mean, you might, uh, but he doesn't cite anything here. Now, I'm sure this isn't the, the total of liberation theology, but that's just, that sets an us and them sort of like this category of of people who are kind of this outside the pale and yet they're these special people that don't really need redemption in Christ because they're not really actually sinners because of how they look or because they're poor. God feels sorry for them. Therefore, you don't really need to repent and turn to Christ. I'll give you stuff via oppressing the oppressor and give you like. That means to share in God's preferential option for the poor and to work to eradicate poverty and marginalization preferential treatment of the poor. Hmm. Well, Jesus tells us what? For you will always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. That's in Matthew 26, verse 11. Furthermore, God shows no partiality in Galatians 2, 6. God shows no favoritism, Acts 10, 34. God shows no partiality, Romans 2, 11. So I don't know about you, but I'm going to go with the scripture on this one. Even if it's one verse or one kind of verse that seems to go against this thing. But oh, by the way, there's multiple verses. Right? Now, God desires everyone to be saved. We know that. But there's a level of freedom that he has granted to every single person, though marred by sin and broken, still says, turn to me. Because that's what love is, right? It's not, you know, programming or forcing or something, coercion. But that's what love is. It's, it's worth it, as C.S. Lewis would say. It was God took the chance, as it were, and worth it. And some people get all bent out of shape about that. It's like, we need to be concerned with our side of, of reality, right? God is good. God is God. Let the, the mysterious things belong to God. Right, But the things that he's revealed to man, well, he's revealed to us that we need to repent and believe. That we are sinners. Men and women, boys and girls, everybody's fallen short of God's glory. And there's a way through Christ alone. Not your deeds, not your goodness, not liberation, not doing the work of anti-racism. Doing the work of justice and equity and all these other things. No. Now those things might be good, but if that's your primary means of salvation, you are damned. You're damned, ladies and gentlemen. If you're thinking that God takes the partiality and shows partiality, which he clearly doesn't. He doesn't show favoritism. He makes no distinctions. And yet this guy's like, well, yeah, that's you know, liberation theology. That's what it says. Great. Well, that's not what the Bible says, so I'm going to go ahead and reject liberation theology. Thank you for telling me what it is. This, isn't a, this is a guy who's supporting it, right? He's not, he's not like me critiquing it. He's supporting it. So don't say, well, liberation theology, you don't understand it. You're misunderstanding it, blah, blah, blah. This guy is saying maybe he doesn't misunderstand it. Maybe he misunderstands it, but I'm understanding him and what he's saying is not biblical. Liberation theology is fundamentally a reflection on praxis, which is to say it's a reflection on our action in the world. And so it follows a threefold structure of seeing, judging, and acting. Seeing involves the perception of unjust structures that perpetuate material poverty. So to that end, many liberation theologians use Marxist or other critical theories in order to make explicit those systems of oppression in every situation that they're analyzing. Ah, look at that. Liberation theology uses Marxism and critical theory. Hmm, 
Well, thanks for telling us. So now we can all know, and the cat is quote unquote out of the proverbial bag. Stop with the nonsense. Don't let somebody at your church or in your organization or from Christianity Today or some Christian school so-called say, well, no, no, we're not teaching that. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. Oh, no, this is just an analytical tool. This is now we're teaching about it. No, no, they are teaching it probably. If you think they are, they probably are. And they are pushing it in their books or academics or whatever, even in public schools. We've seen this routinely now. It's a concerted effort to undermine personal liberty, freedom, and responsibility. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is, both in the church, in the culture, and just in general. And so they're saying, oh, I'm seeing these things. Oh, there's oppression. Therefore, I'm going to use these systems of oppression to oppress other people because they're oppressed. But these people are oppressed. I'm going to oppress the oppressor. It's literally like six-year-olds, seven-year-olds on the playground shoving and doing this. And, well, you did that to me. I'm going to do this to you. Well, I'm bigger than you, so I'm going to do... Now I'm going to take this. Now I'm going to get three kids around you and knock you down because you're bigger than us, but you're not... You're bigger than me, but not all three of us. Like, what are you, children? Get over it, okay? It's nonsense. And liberation theology is void. It's empty. Thank you again for this guy. I appreciate him at least being clear and cogent with it. But it's not biblical. Now, I understand that he has it based in some Roman Catholic guy from the 70s, who's, I think, still alive in his early 90s. Yeah, 93s. Um, but what's the fruit of it, right? And that's the other thing. We're called to be fruit inspectors, right? To see people's fruit. Good trees produce good fruit. Bad trees produce good fruit, right? No. As I looked at one of my last videos, the little, you know, the little sign, it's produced in Portland. Now, is Portland... Are people moving to Portland left and right because of just the renaissance and the flourishing, the human flourishing and the liberty and the freedom that's going on there? No, people are terrified. Portland is burning. Now, it might not be burning at this very second, but it has been crumbling for a long time now. But people are literally being, ter they're literally terrorists. And what are they doing? They're upholding a certain view of liberation, saying we're going to Destroy the power structure. We've seen the videos. We, you know, we're going to burn it all down. We need to eradicate. We need to defund the police. We need to do this. We need to let, take this. Dismantle the police. We need to take down the patriarchy. On and on. All of this stems from a liberation theology. And, and just the root cause of Marxism in general. Involves seeing the situation in light of the God who sides with the oppressed. No single person is responsible for systems of oppression like racism or the exploitation of the poor, even though some people may participate in these systems willfully to a greater or lesser extent. However, systems of oppression are bigger than any one person, structural patterns of oppression. Finally, acting involves working to correct these oppressive situations. It can be something as simple as giving... Acting. So... What is he saying, right? Doing the work of anti-racism, which is the hamster wheel of death. You're on the treadmill. You're never going to get there. That's not the gospel, right? You're resting in Christ. God shows no partiality. You're resting in him. And that's the whole point. That's the whole goal to be in Christ. Repent and believe in the gospel. You will be changed. New life comes. And liberation from sin does come. Not liberation from material needs. And he says, oh, lib you know, <clears throat> material poverty is always bad. Yes, because people are sinners. He doesn't, he doesn't address, he doesn't go back further. Oh, people are sinners. Therefore, I need to be my sinner self and go do this and hurt you and pass this law and burn your building down and take your money and give it to these people. No, Jesus says you'll always have the poor. God shows no favoritism. He shows no partiality. Let's be biblical, ladies and gentlemen. Don't use liberation, liberation theology. Don't, and, and see it. When you see it, call it out. Ask it. At least say, where is that in the scripture? Because I thought God didn't show partiality. I thought this. I thought that. I thought we will always have the poor with us. We should work. We should serve. We should have the soup kitchen and help the poor and, you know, this and that and the other. But at the same time, we should also make it more possible for people to live in a free society to be responsible. That's what Vody Bachman's book talking about. His first, his intro in his first chapter. He's talking about this and he had all these things stacked against him. And yet, what did he do? He won. He succeeded because of not the government, not people doing anti-worrisism work and all this other stuff, but because of discipline, because of his mother, because of correction and, and all these other things that basically he should have been a statistic, but he was fought all those odds because of where he was at and, and the, 
really God's grace, right? And people doing real stuff, tangible things. So anyway, I hope you find this well or I hope this finds you well. And um, don't forget to like and subscribe. I really appreciate that. And until next time, I'm helping you be against the world for the sake of the world. Take care.